Uh, my name is Malavika Raghavan, and I head something called the Future of Finance Initiative uh, that's based in Chennai, actually, uh, which is awesome for po policy, because normally you never have anything based in Chennai. Uh, and it's uh, based out of the IFMR Finance Foundation. So a uh, quick little bit about myself. I'm a lawyer by training, but in the last couple of years, I've been working in policy and strategy. And this is like a brand new gig that I started two and a half months ago, because this is a brand new initiative that we've uh, kind of set up in partnership with uh, the Gates Foundation to really look at the customer protection challenges that come out when we are in this uh, moment in our country's history where we're seeing this massive, like, you know, large-scale change sweeping retail finance, right? Whether that's driven by India Stack, payment banks, rising mobile usage, you name it. And that's really changing the face of retail finance, and that's why we're interested in this. And obviously, uh, Mr. Ratan P. Watal and his committee have really gotten involved in the digital payment side of things in a big way. Um, I would say the reason why this uh, report is so interesting is because uh, it, it really tries to reimagine what it looks like uh, in terms of regulation for the country when it comes to payment systems. So far, we have been, all of you who, are, who have companies, have, uh, if you have a lawyer and have taken legal advice, have been looking at something called the Payment and Settlement Systems Act, uh, which is kind of not, it's built for a world where you had check payments, right? It's not really looking at like UPI and APS and that kind of thing. Uh, so first thing I wanted to show you, was what a front page of a report looks like, in case you haven't had the joy of downloading 218 pages uh, to read them uh, at very short notice. So um, let me give you a little bit of a story about the report itself. Uh, it was This committee was set up uh, in August 2017, uh, 2016 with a one-year term. So by 2017, they were supposed to deliver the report. Um, however, in a surprise for Indian bureaucracy, what happened is in four months' time, that's eight months before their scheduled end date, they actually delivered this report, uh, and they released it to the public just between Christmas and New Year's, which was like quite excellent timing, I must say, for my holiday plans. Uh, so what did the report really say? Um, I want to start off with the vision. Uh, I'm not going to extract any other part of the report before you get scared. I think the important thing to highlight here, which I've tried to do with very bad like hand-eye coordination, is the fact that they're thinking about real choice, right? Uh, it's very laudable for this report and the committee. They really talked about how cash has been in use for 2,600 years, if I remember the words. And they say that uh, it's kind of served us well. And what they want to do is open up more payment avenues for people to use different digital channels. But what they then go on to say is that they want to reduce the cash to GDP ratio by 50% in the next three years. So we currently have about 12.4% cash to GDP um, you know, ratio of the, in the country, at least uh, we did before demonetization. Uh, and what they want to do is in three years' time, you have only about 6% of that. Um, I don't know if this strikes any of you as a contradiction. For those of us who are focused on customer protection, and we are completely agnostic, right? We are not saying digital is great or cash is great or cash is terrible. Or, you know, we just come from purely a customer standpoint, and all we want, our vision, is for uh, customers to have a range of channels through which they can transact confidently and securely in this new world which we're entering. So that's kind of the vision, and I'll jump straight into the recommendations. I don't have any other slides. Uh, we started putting together slides, and it turned out that there were 13 recommendations, again, 218 pages. And I think since I started, I only have about like 10 minutes left with you guys. So uh, what I'm going to do is kind of put them into these big five buckets and just talk through those. If you have any questions at any point, obviously, you, we can keep talking afterwards, and uh, we're all on Twitter as well. Uh, so what's the big biggie for all of the people in the room, what you might be interested in, is the the committee is really making recommendations for open access to our payment systems to all non-bank payment services providers. So that's what the PSP actually is. Uh, and they're saying that if you're a payment services provider, you should be able to directly plug into the RTGS, NEFT, or IMPS system. Uh, on the surface of it, that's a, I mean, it's a great recommendation in that it allows more payment services providers to go straight to the payment systems without having to go through banks, as traditionally has been the case. I think where we think that the report could have done a bit more is kind of lay out how this affects banking and escrow arrangements. I understand there was a talk in the Hasgeek Pune catch-up about escrow, uh, which we were actually hoping would happen here because we have asked the committee for feedback on this and not received anything yet. And the reason why I think this is important is because uh, those of you who are wallets in the room or work for a wallet company, you know that there are two types, right, of wallets. Um, and one backs onto a bank's uh, account which is actually uh, protected by your deposit guarantee. So if you demand the money, the bank is obliged to give it out to you. But the other kinds of wallets don't have this deposit guarantee at all. So what then happens when somebody goes down? 
right? There is no obligation on the Reserve Bank of India to be a lender of last resort. So as you can see already, there is some direct connection that we need to be mindful of on a, on a kind of systemic level in the connection between payments and banking. I know that we are kind of detwinning this and we have this information gateway and, I mean, sorry, highway and payments highway and credit highway and all of this stuff we talk about, but they are inherently linked and I think that's something to be mindful of. So that's kind of first point. Um, the second point is uh, on a really kind of unprecedented um, format that they've set up for payments regulation, which is quite interesting reading actually. So they weigh up two alternatives. They say we should have independent payments regulation. Currently, as some of you will know, the RBI regulates payments under the uh, authority it has under the Payments and Settlement Systems Act. Um, and what they really say is that where they finally end up, they f first talk about a completely independent regulator and then they look at that model. Then they talk about a board of, which is independent within the RBI, and then they break that down. And I should mention, actually, one thread that runs through this entire report is about competition, how we need more comp competition and more market entry and more kind of neutrality and more transparency, which is like all great stuff, especially for our um, market, I think. And therefore, they say that Given that we want this drive for competition, we should have an independent regulator for one main reason, really, which is that the RBI currently runs commercially the RTGS and NEFT. So as you know, RTGS is for high value transactions above two lakhs, I think, and, and the NEFT is for low value transactions. And the IMPS system, which we are all talking about in the morning uh, as well, is managed by the NPCI. So they say now you have a commercial function and you're also regulating payments. There's a fundamental conflict of interest here, right? And we have some sympathy for that view because it's true, like that's what's happening. Uh, so again, as, um, as kind of re responding to this report, one thing that we are uh, happy with is that you should have a clearer operational framework and you should actually think about, you know, clarifying how payments work in this country. However, there's one next step that they take is on the institutional level. What they say is, you have this RBI. Actually, you should have an independent board within the RBI, which is the, we already have a department of the RBI which oversees payments, which some of you have had the luxury of like dealing with. Uh, what they say is that you should give it independent board status, something that I don't really understand how it would work because the RBI has one central board and everybody listens to that central board. What they're saying up is say, set up another kind of power center of sorts within the RBI and then we'll do some conflict rules for when, you know, this power center doesn't agree with this power center, right? So I don't know how many of you are interested in like power play and dynamics, but this is already creating some kind of like Handani, you know, kind of big brother, younger brother fight. Uh, I think the other point to note is that um, in our view, you know, the, the one thing the committee does do is talk about large scale uh, spinning out of the RTGS and NEFT, right? So they're saying in the long term, RBI shouldn't be owning RTGS and NEFT. They should just spin it out. So then where is the conflict point, right? Like if you're not, if you're going to spin it out anyway, how is the conflict happening? And then I suppose the other thing to think about is if you, if you don't have a conflict and you do have this new regulator, the kicker in this whole thing is that they say you should then, the central government should set up rules for delineating what is a systemically important payment system, SIPs, and a non-SIP. And the SIPs should anyway be regulated by the RBI. So what do we have here? We have two power centers, big brother, younger brother, and the big brother looks after SIPs, and the younger brother gets the non-important guys, and we go through all of this conflict rules and so on and so forth, and we have this entity. So, you know, somewhere that whole, and, and RTGS is going to get spun out. So it's kind of a lot of noise. I mean, if your fundamental reason is to ensure competition and balance, you're kind of doing a lot of things which uh, may not actually, those principles kind of fall away anyway, if you're spinning out RTGS and uh, if you're giving back the main <laughs> payment systems to the RBI to regulate. So anyway, so for all of these reasons and several others, which we've set out in our eloquently worded response, which is, uh, which I hope you've read, uh, we just think that maybe, you know, headline, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yes, I said that right. Um, moving on to the last three buckets, um, cons consumer protection and data protection. So uh, these are kind of things that we hold dear, which is why I wanted to flag it up to you guys. Uh, the, the great thing about the report is it does put it front and center. So normally in our legislations, we come from a very kind of provider perspective, which is fine. Uh, but here they have said, you know, we should amend the main act, which is the PSSA I was talking about, to put in a provision for consumer protection. 
a whole set of provisions. This is great, except on like closer inspection, what we find is we are defaulting to a very 1950s, 60s view of consumer protection, which a lot of us working in the space, we've kind of moved on from, in that we just put disclosure requirements, just disclose everything, then it's caveat emptor. Like if I tell you that my product does all of these things and I take permission to uh, you know, check your messages, control your vibration, and do all sorts of things on your phone, then it's cool. Like whatever, you know, if you, if you download the app or whatever the payment system you have. Um, then, and then the other part it says is awareness creation. So it says, you know, you've set up all of these programs and play all those fantastic movies before uh, a film starts about how digital payments are like great and all of this stuff, which is fine, you know, but we know it hasn't worked. Where we are right now, at least with the FFI and IFMR Finance Foundation and a lot of other people, we're moving towards a suitability regime, right? Where you're saying, if you are creating risk for the consumer, you need to take some responsibility and do it well, right? And there are lots of providers in the market who are doing it well. Like, um, as I will talk about in my talk later this afternoon, which plug, plug, you should uh, attend if you're around, there are some apps who do it really well. They only take two permissions and they still do a digital payment. And some apps which are taking like 80. Why? You know? So these kind of questions haven't really been thought through. And that kind of links to the data protection point as well. Um, on this, again, I'll try and be quick. Um, what are the main things that they say? One, they say data protection is important, win, but they say we should do the data protection that is done in our wonderful Information Technology Act, which exists in the country, follow that regime. And then they say uh, banks don't currently have and payment services providers the kind of power to look into the funds that are being used in their, uh, you know, look into the data to understand what funds are being used for money laundering and these kind of purposes. So I said three things there, right? On the first one, data protection, good. We agree. Awesome. Second point, the data protection regime in this country, we should adhere to. Now, as I will say in my talk later on this evening, I think it's an open secret that the IT Act, for those of you who know that it exists, sets up a regime for sen protection of sensitive personal data. But in practice, um, it's worded in such a way that you have no purpose limitation hardly any obligations in terms of what you do with the customer protection, customer data, which I'm sure those of the payment providers in the room are dealing with very carefully. Uh, but if you don't, like, to be honest, there's a limited amount of enforcement mechanism there to come after you if you do something wrong with the data. So to kind of, when there's so much lobbying in the country to kind of put in more protections for the IT Act, it seems, uh, I don't know why they didn't kind of take a step further. We were hoping for them to say, we need to be more proactive on this front. Um, and then the last point, um, as I was talking about, was around the fact that, you know, if you are in this kind of data protection world, um, like, what do you need to do in terms of um, ensuring that, you know, that, like, what are the kinds of uh, particular enforcement mechanisms you kind of put in place as well? Um, was there anything else I wanted to say on data protection? I don't think so. But I'll come back to it. I think I feel like I need to make one more point, but I'll come back to it because I can see I have six minutes left. Um, and lastly, so mandating digital, um, they basically say that a lot of these uh, kind of payments that exist in government, government to government should be digital, government to person direct benefit transfers should be digital. We're not really, I mean, I'm not going to go into pros and cons, but that's kind of happening anyway. I think the one that we would like to flag up is people to government. They say for certain types of utility payments above a certain level, people should be Sorry, I think I've lost. Yeah. People should be forced to do it digitally, uh, which again seems just a bit a step too far, really. If you're starting to mandate that certain types of payments are digital, what about older people? What about disabled people? What about people who don't have access to a digital channel? All the standard concerns where we are not there yet. And then lastly, this was the great part of the report that me and my team, and I should point out they're here, Bhushan and Varun, they will be helping with the Q&As, so you will see them. Uh, we really enjoyed this section. We started seeing all these cool things in the report that weren't really uh, connected to digital payments, which was quite fun when you're like, reading it in a hurry at like 2 a.m. in the morning. I think uh, an interesting one to think about is they have an entire section around how Aadhaar should be used for PAN filings. That it is what it is. Um, the other one is they say that you should have uh, state-run programs and provider-run programs to highlight the costs of cash. Great. Uh, and then they say you should have measures to disincentivize cash. So if you're a, a merchant and you're handling cash payments above a certain level, you actually have a pen penalty or a levy uh, on you just for doing a transaction in cash. And one thing that is more relevant for people like you and me in the room 
essentially they say if you are doing a high value cash transaction just as a person not a merchant uh, now you know we have this rule that if you make a payment above 50000 rupees you have to produce your pan card so if you go to buy gold or you do all of these other activities you have to track the pan card they are saying you lower that threshold so it could be you know um yeah that you have to uh, if you are uh, so i'll just give you an example uh, we work in uh, affordable finance uh, for housing and you have families who are buying their first house which is an affordable house you know low value house not very uh, rich people and they often come with their advance which is you know it's not a very big amount for people like maybe you and me in this room it'll be like 20 30000 50000 they generally do that in cash because that's how you know they don't have they don't cut checks you know so what happens to these kind of payments if you say you need a pan filing maybe it's a farmer maybe they don't do pan filings you know maybe they don't so it's just i feel like we could have been a bit more thoughtful in this and then lastly and most fun of all is direct courier billing i only have 4 minutes left uh, but i feel like this is something that's really heating up in the market um how do i summarize this there's a lot about it in the report you should go read it it's great we reading and i don't normally say that about government reports uh, but so three things firstly they say direct carrier billing for those of you who don't know which i'm sure all of you do is that you buy products through your mobile phone balance right um that's what it is so if you have a prepaid mobile phone balance deduct balance by product postpaid by product appears on bill at end of month cool now what they are saying is direct carrier billing already exists in the market as a kind of mobile value added service so like your ringtone and your call back they're saying that's pretty much a like direct carrier billing so you know we should just allow it for all products if you want to take out a loan if you want to buy a car you should just allow it through your mobile phone balance the other thing they then say is um yeah that you know this kind of treatment should be given by the rbi and they should change rules for it and so on so our objections to this are on three levels first of all a service delivered on a mobile phone is not a mobile is is a mobile value added service so long as it's tied to your main service right we don't think that direct carrier billing is actually a mobile value added service i should also flag that in the mvas market uh in 2014 uh unauthorized deductions and activations had gone to such a level that there were 10 lakh complaints filed with try try then passed regulations which essentially shut down the market volumes have gone from like i don't know like down to 7% or something of what they were previously and so it's a market that's rife with like basically a lot of misbilling um in light of our reasoning which we've set out in our recommendations we think that this is not actually mvas so we hope the rbi will take a look and the ministry of finance will take a look but more importantly if we do think it's direct carrier billing is you know a financial service then if you're like you should be treated like a wallet you know what do you do with the paytm you put money they deduct the money they follow ppi guidelines great so in the spirit of competition and market entry and so on you want to do direct carry billing and it's like you know deducting like a ppi wallet follow the regulations great if you are doing it in a postpaid balance what is that it's not a deduction it's essentially you're giving someone finance to buy something right like a credit card like i have my amex card i want to buy a car or i want to buy flight tickets they give me credit to they finance that purchase and i pay them back with interest at the end of the month essentially this is what is postpaid balance direct credit billing fine do go ahead and do it just follow what are the rules for credit so this is our reasoning on all those three points i think i've kind of <laughs> come to the end of my time uh, if we have few minutes for questions i'd be very very happy to answer and i should also uh, point out bhushan who's right here uh, who is responsible for all of the mistakes in our response uh, <laughs> he works with me at ifmr finance foundation so if we have a few minutes uh, we can answer questions thank you malvika uh we'll take a few questions there is one at the back there uh one here manasa so we'll start from the back and then i'll come to manasa uh could you just introduce yourself while asking the question thank you hello i am manu bhadwaj formerly of jp morgan chase yep. um how comfortable are you with uh, quasi industrial uh, regulatory bodies like fdic and sipc equivalents uh and their future in india potentially well to be honest i don't really have a view on those i think i mean i, I don't want to riff off of it because obviously i'm here working for uh, ffi um i mean i think i think you know regulation and new regulatory bodies are are good obviously it it helps you have more um kind of uh, en- enlightened regulation in particular spaces but we do have a culture of setting up new bodies in india which don't always work so i think case by case analysis Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Hi, Malavika. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I really have two questions. 
the first is with respect to the antitrust perspectives that the committee spoke about. So um, I remember Yadvendra saying in the morning that consumers don't really have, uh, can't really choose the payment gateway uh, to sort of make a digital payment. And the Competition Act sort of has a host of uh, things that it bars, like tie-in arrangement, exclusive arrangements. Do you think um, there's a way out for, for this uh, from a regulatory perspective? Is there best practices from other countries that we could follow? My second question is with respect to, uh, sorry, would you? Would I don't you know, are you allowed two questions? Alok is less strict than he used to be in law yeah. school. <laughs> you, you can just quickly just open it. Yeah. This mic. <laughs> uh, the second question is with respect to the disclosures and caveat emptor um, yeah. regime that you said. Mm -hmm. Are we, is it best to move towards an ISDA uh, like standard form agreement? Are you a lawyer? Yes. Ah, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, okay. So I'll take the first one and just pitch in. Um, so on competition, the thing is that competition, uh, competition issues don't exist in my view in a separate box. They have direct implications for consumer protection. It's a two-way thing. Under the Competition Act in this country, it's anyway, uh, it's only companies that you know kind of adjudicated at the company level. It's not at the consumer level anyway. Um, I think there are great best practices and consumers can choose. Like I think the CFPB, for instance, in the States is a great model. The Australian model, which is cited in this report as with an independent regulator, that's also a good model. There's also worst practice, right? Like if you look, um, and with no disrespect, I think the Kenyan market, the way it's, it's a classic competition case, the way, uh, just to, I just saw my time went to zero, but the way that market developed very quickly, tell me if I'm talking too fast, is they had a bunch of telecom players, market tended towards a monopoly, uh, quite like something unheard of, of course, and they have one single mobile operator who offers digital payments and credit, M-Pesa style things. Now, uh, in this whole digital payment space and credit space, what you think is the first movers will have high levels of, um, you know, price uh, pricing. And then as more and more people come in, pricing goes down, consumers have all this choice. Because they have a single mobile operator acting as a front end, now there is data coming out of Kenya to show that there is price stickiness, right? So consumers are still paying the same, and there's a big, as you know, for those of you in the mobile space, now there's this big case and all of these disputes going on between service providers and the mobile operators because the cut is too, fr too much on the front end and that means some people are denied access to certain people and certain other services. All of this morass of things can be sorted. I do think that because we have uh, you know, some, those two countries that I mentioned, uh, it's very easy to... Uh, ensure that at least there is an ethic of consumer choice from a provider perspective. And I, I'm a strong believer that industry has a big role to play. Like, it should not be that you have to be beaten on the head with a stick. Um, I think you should be able to do that otherwise. Did you have anything to add? Yeah, on the ISDA point, uh, what I would say is that ISDA is really a long-form agreement which works between sophisticated... We just, we just hold the mic closer, yeah. Yeah. And ISDA is a kind of derivative agreement, basically. Yeah, for swaps. Yeah. So, between a retail consumer and a institution, it probably will not uh, play out so well. Yeah. And what was the second question? It was to do with the ISDA, should we have an ISDA style for consumers? Caveat emptor. Oh, yeah. This is very important, Alex. Sorry, I'll just take a minute. Caveat emptor, I think, is, uh, I've argued in a blog post for IFMR Finance Foundation, I think it's an outdated standard. I don't think as consumers, we need to be, you know, dealing with 800-page click wrap agreements. I think there's an enlightened way we've done it. Look up the Schumer box in America. They are doing, like, you know, it's intelligent people using phones. And, of course, you can have a level of complexity, but if you make a um, kind of a, a standard which works for everybody in the room, you're going to get more back, right? And I think we are owe ourselves a fairer standard where you have a fiduciary relationship almost with your consumer and you take some responsibility. I think we're in a place where we can take responsibility. Right, some more questions? There's one more at the back there. And we'll come to, I'll come to you. And soon? Yeah. 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 I mean, the report has recommended that we adopt carrier billing as a form of digital payment. And as I said, uh, there's our reasoning is having looked into it, uh, analysis both on legal and commercial sides and consumer protection side, it doesn't appear to be a digital payment. 
So I think it is conflating uh, categories if you call it a digital payment. Uh, currently, it's in the gray area because what happens is that telcos have to share uh, their revenues with uh, with uh, the Department of Tel Telecom, and it's not sure how uh, vast revenues will be shared between the telcos and the department, and, and that, which is why it's not picking up really. Yeah. Hi, I am Akshay. I am a developer at PayPal. Hi, Akshay. Um, as a consumer, an important part for me is interoperability, and I'm not sure if the report covers anything on that lines. Basically, if I have a 200 rupees in my Paytm wallet, I want to transfer it to say PayU or uh, MobiQuick. Yeah. So, what are the recommendations there, and yeah. uh, is the government okay with that? Yeah, they actually have uh, quite a good section on competition and market entry. So uh, for interoperability, they basically uh, deal with it at several levels. So they say ownership is one thing, infrastructure is one thing, and technology is another one. So they say all across these levels, you should have a uh, interoperability between uh, payment systems as well. So even at the fundamental level, between RTGS and whatever else comes up. And then they said should, there should be interoperability between wallets and PSPs, basically all kind of uh, providers as well. So yeah, it does push for that. It, it recommends, it doesn't go into technical aspects, unfortunately, so. That's it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so you're talking about an independent payment regulator, right? I'm not. Uh, yeah. So N NPC NPCI is kind of acting like one right now, but so, I mean, they kind of operate the IMPS and everything. So. Uh, how will the role of MPCI anything change from I'm just digging into the vital yeah. committee report like how do you if there's a new independent payment regulator yeah they so. do talk about it yeah yeah and in fact uh, so it's interesting right this whole interoperability competition opening up things they also explain it to NPCI so NPCI is currently has in its uh, kind of board or management only banks they say non-bank PSP should also be on the board of NPCI um, and they say this new uh, regulator, if it comes into place, they say that it should actually have on its board uh, all of these people, limit RBI um, appointees to the board and so on. Uh, what it does say about NPCI is that uh, if you kind of diffuse the kind of ownership of NPCI, it also says you should have multiple NPCIs. So it says like, so it's kind of envisioning a market where you have multiple NPCIs, multiple payment systems, multiple non-banks plugging into various payment systems with interoperability between all of these payment systems. And then we don't know what happens to the banking side of things. So it's it's great in that it pushes for a lot of this. And I would say like NPCI is basically an entity that's running a payment system. They are acting like a regulator that's, I mean, I don't really interact with them. I don't know if that's what they should be doing. Uh, anything yeah, to add? NPCI is really a system regulator, system provider right now under the Payment and Settlement Systems Act. Yeah. And uh, the vision is really to have more system providers so that uh, there, in terms of transaction charges, uh, there is a lot of competition in fair pricing. Yeah. Uh, we have time for maybe one last question. Yeah, there's one person there. So, hi, uh, this is Ruchi from PayU. Right, so one of the things which I have been hearing is about the transactional charges and other things, so it might be a vested interest in asking this question. Yeah. But don't you think that the redu reduction of any cost by regulation or by increasing this kind of uh, efforts yeah. will actually kill the innovation that is happening in the industry? Yeah, and this is a point, I mean, it's interesting, right, because we have this report which very much stresses on, on competition and in, in order to drive fair pricing for the consumer, which I'm very much in support of. However, what a lot of the recommendations do, which is this, uh, you know, this point on mandating digital, and there's an entire whole section there which you should go and look up between recommendation, I think, six to eight or something. Anyway, so they basically talk about how government should absorb the costs of digital, right, continuously. Uh, it seems like... Like we're trying to pick a winner here, and I think if government starts absorbing costs of certain digital players and not other digital players, I, I find it a bit, yeah, it is a bit problematic. I actually think it would be great, I mean, and this is just something I'm throwing out there in my own personal capacity, no reflection on anybody I work for. I actually think the, the bigger kind of elephant in the room throughout this report is cash versus digital, right? They have an entire section on high cost of cash. They do not do a similar, they actually say digital is low priced and low cost or something like that. And the, the kind of rhetoric in the report is that digital costs zero, cash costs so much to the uh, government for printing and circulating and so on. I think it would have been great if they had done analysis on the last part. And I think if you want to create a competitive market, you shouldn't try and um, work against cash so much. What you should do is build a free point of use for digital, right? Then it's equal. Like cash are spending so much to make it free to the consumer. Digital should also work in the same way. How, how is it fair to say, you know, 
uh, we'll kind of keep on disincentivizing this and we won't put in. So I think that's okay. I think if you build an infrastructure which is free for use for everybody so that they're not passing on costs, that one thing. The difficulty comes where you have different providers at different stages of their growth offering various transaction charges for commercial reasons. Then clearly if you're favoring one kind of, like UPI currently has, uh, actually somebody asked this question in the morning, how much does it cost? I think it's currently zero. It's actually 50p per transaction plus a 14% service charge of the transaction value. Uh, currently it's being subsidized. So, you know, it, it's, it's, there are all these competition and pricing implications. Sorry if I meandered a bit, but I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Malvika. Thank you, Bhushan. Yeah. Uh, so, please give them a round of applause.